time, Devil Child. All right, buddy. We're live now. You ready? Get ready. Yeah, so you ready? You got your buy ones. Again, don't make me waste this live stream, please. Please don't make me waste this live stream. So you got your Bible with you? I don't work. I don't work for you. Yeah, you, I know you work for the devil, but don't be scared, man. Prove to me your God is real. I'm about you, young man. Uh, listen, old man, you can put me in your place by refuting me from scripture, not your bark. So can you do it scripturally? Or are you going to just talk tough? Man, I don't do what you want me to do. I don't know what you think you is. Uh, who, who is, man? What be like, man? What up? You know me, homie, you, my brother. homie? I feel you. Yeah, man, I feel I mean, you. You sound man. like your daddy the devil. You know what I'm saying? That's okay, man. It's all good. It's all good, man. Hey, you going right. to you you tell you. everybody what you said earlier? Yeah, listen, all man. The and all the other crazy stuff. Man, like they the know I said all the time. I'm muzzle dogs and they're, they're satanic gods. Man, what's all in the hood? You got your Bible or no, man? You want to deal with the Bible? Did I just open this up? I was supposed to go walk, get in shape so I can look as good as you for the ladies, right? Because I know that's what you do. You like to look good for the ladies. But I sacrificed that so I can deal with you. You got your Bible? You are, oh, your daddy, the devil. What are you even talking about? Just go live, man. Man, what's up? Like what are you doing, like, man? Boy. Man, hey, I like this guy's accent. Anyway, you sound like a Muslim. Okay, it's all right. Then muzzle me. If I'm a Muslim, muzzle me for you got. You got your Bible ready. Let's go, man. We ain't got time to be playing around right. for the third time. We got okay, our Bible, Mafia. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Go to Genesis 1924, son, because you don't I believe ain't going thing. nowhere you want me to go. One yeah. God, is it one God or not? Let's do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Of course I do. I don't believe your Jesus is God. Your Jesus okay. is of the devil. So is is so I'm asking another question. Is is Jesus Christ the Father? No, he's not. So he's not the Father, but he's God. Sure. Does that make any sense to you? Do you want me to answer you or you want to keep screaming? I mean, I'll let you I, scream. I asked the question for a reason, for an answer. So I'm waiting for your answer, yes, my friend. The, you okay, my friend, because the Father is not the only one who's God. Can you show me where it says God is one person? That there's only there's one two person. God. Let me did you hear what I said? Can you show me where it says Seven. God is one person? That there's only one there's person who's God. There are two God. One person. There are two God. One person. Do you, I mean, you're going to answer you're going to just shout, man, because people here are not here for comedy, man. You said that Jesus Christ is God, but then he's not the Father, even sure. though the Father is God. Does that make any sense to you? Yes, it makes biblical sense. Well, explain it to me what, you, what kind of sense that makes okay. to you. Explain yes. it to me. I want to understand what you're saying. Can I say? See, I don't want to hang up on you because I'm being entertained. My friend, is Eve Adam or she married to Adam? Yeah. This is gonna I answer mean, the question. Well, it's gonna answer God? the question. Is Eve Adam? In the me. Is please. Eve Adam or is she married to Adam? When you put these in the Bible for me, I'll listen. But yeah, Genesis five verse two. Is Eve Adam or is she married to Adam? I'm giving you the Bible. Genesis five verse two. What do about? Because it's going to show you you don't understand what the Bible says about oneness. Are you scared of the Bible? I thought the Bible is your friend, man. Besides me, there is no savior. Go yeah. look up Isaiah really? 43 okay. 11. Can you go to Obadiah verse 21? Read for me Obadiah verse 21. Verse here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Yes, one. Can you what? find two or three? Yes, because even Adam and Eve are one flesh. How many flesh is that? The same word, Achad. Find it. Okay. God said Adam no flesh is heaven. So no. now all of a sudden, flesh goes into heaven? When you shout, you're only embarrassing yourself. You're not making your case. I'm trying to let me let you make your case. Okay. The word one, achad, achad, the Hebrew word one, Genesis 2.24. Same word as you. Male and female become basar achad, one flesh. How many flesh is that? It says one flesh. But Adam is flesh. Eve is flesh. Once again, one God. I go by what the Bible says. Hey, your Arabic <laughs> might be great. Your Arabic might be so it's not good. Arabic, it's dude. A, it might be the best in the world. I don't care about none of that. We hey, listening to the Word of God. Him. Word of God says, I, even I, am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. But you call Jesus Christ God, but you don't call him the Father. Even though he calls himself the Father. Hey, friend, you know, the more you scream, it's not going to make you, like, sound clearer. So just, okay, calm down. Don't scream. Okay, listen to me. Do you really want me to answer you or you don't want me to answer you? You're wasting my time. Yes, I'm asking. I'm, okay, can you go to I'm Isaiah 63 verses, verses 7 to 9 for me? Go at all. Can all right, you go you to Isaiah 63 question. verses 7 to 9 or no? Are we wasting time? Because I'm giving you Bible. You don't want to read your Bible. Why are you scared of your Bible? Only demons are scared of the Bible. Even I am the Lord beside me. The there same, is no yeah, you're quoting. Uh, you do, you know where you, do you know where you're quoting from? You're quoting Isaiah 43, verse 11. Can you now go to Isaiah 63, 7 to 9? 
Can you go to Isaiah 63, 7 tonight? From the heavens. Is it going to be Jesus Can Christ? Can we going to go to Isaiah 63, 7 tonight or no? Just a black you won't be that. You won't be the through your little tone and stuff, huh? Let's go to Jude 1, 25. To the only wise God, our Savior. Only one. All right. Why don't you read only 24? One. Read 24 and 25. Don't start at 25. Read 24. Read 24. Hold on. Read Hold Jude on. 1, 24, 25. Please. Hold on. Yeah, I'm Isaiah 42. I am the Lord, and that is my name. Hey guys, uh, my do you guys want me to hang up on him? He's a waste of time. He's not reading scriptures. Do you guys want me to keep talking to this guy? It's up to you guys because I do it for you guys, not him. Because you see, every scripture I give him, he's scared to quote. One God, and you don't even believe in one God. You're right. I don't. Trinity, you even Trinity? Yes, I don't believe in all of you because you said so. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So you guys want me to hang up, or do you want me to have him just keep screaming and entertain you? What do you want me to do? I don't. We don't, we don't do in your tone. We ain't doing what you want to do. All right? You want I to do 25, right? Can you read you 24? Got, and I'm here. Can you read the, go to Jude 24? Okay, go to Jude 24 then. Can you read 24 and 25? No. Oh, either you're going to print your verses up and I'll explain them to you. Oh, okay. So do that. To, oh, do oh, you want me to quote the. All right. Okay. Hey, first, last post Isaiah 63, 7 to 9. Same book of Isaiah. I want you. you want me to read the verses? You're going to talk over me and embarrass yourself. We're waiting. Okay, Isaiah 63, 7 to 9. Can you, bring up the, can you let me? Because I don't want to see this. Do you I'm want reading. me to read the verses? You're going to talk over me because you're scared of the Bible because the Bible is your nightmare. You want me to read it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do that again. Do that one more time. <laughs> you sound like a yeah, sheep. <laughs> All right, Isaiah 63, 7 uh, to 9. Isaiah 63, 7 to 9. Yeah, I'm getting it for you. Can I? Israel, the Lord our God is one this Lord. This guy's not listening, so you guys, he's a waste of time. You see, he's scared of the Bible, guys. He's lying to people. Yeah, we lie. You laugh, sir. You laugh. You laugh, man. Yeah, because I know it's only one. You see what I'm saying? Because it's one, sucker. Yeah, I laugh. Hey, first hey, last before the I'm rapture. Man. The word, the the Bible, this man telling you all these lies. Yeah, can you, show me, can you show me the word it's oneness or modalism in the Bible? Can you show me the word oneness or modalism? Modalist in the Bible? Oneness? The word oneness, not one. Oneness. Can you show me that in the Bible? Are you ready? I and my father are one. You're sure about that? I said, I know you're illiterate. You're illiterate. Okay, here's the verses. You keep screaming, I'm going to hang up on you. Here are the verses. Shut up and listen to the Bible, man. Isaiah 63, 7 to 9. Let me read it, dude. Calm down, breathe. You're going to have a heart attack, man. Isaiah 63, 7 to 9. First and last, you want to post it before the rapture? I block you too, first and last. Come on, first and last. Hello? Okay. I will mention the loving kindnesses, the loving kindnesses of the Lord, and the praises of the Lord. Yeah, this guy. You, you stupid dog, man. Your embarrassment to your mother, man. All right. Yeah, these are the guys that are going to prove there. First and last. Why are you so slow, bro? Should I block you too? Man, bro, you're so slow. All right. These are the oneness. These are the modalists. These are the ones that are going to be proving the truth of their God. God won, God won, man. God won, man. You know what I'm saying? Son. Hey, son, God won, man. Okay. Now, I was going to go walk. But I, you know, I don't know. I can come back later. This is a waste of time. If you guys want, I'll come back later. I gotta go exercise. I gotta lose some weight. These love handles, so I can look like truth defenders, right? Because this guy thought he's gonna be serious. So you can't get any of them to be serious, man. They're none of them are qualified, man. None of them qualified. Okay, man. Yeah, man. What's up? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, what's up? Like, man. Yeah, man. Whoa, got one, man. I said, okay. Do you want me to address some of these points for you guys or no? Because I can just probably walk after this. Because it's going to be probably too late for people. You want me to address some, uh, some of these uh, points? We just finished, man. A session. And boy, boy. Okay. Here's, here's what he's referring to. Isaiah 43, verse 11. Isaiah 43, verse 11. Isaiah 43, verse 11. Let's look at it. Okay. What happened, Protestant? You left? Maybe if, uh, first last can post it. First last, I won't block you, son. Okay. I, even I am the Lord. Beside me, there is no Savior. Did you catch it? I Even I am the Lord. Beside me, there is no Savior, right? Did you guys catch it? This is the passage he's using. I, even I am the Lord. Beside me, there is no Savior. Okay. Let's go to Isaiah 63, verses 7 to 9. Let's count. 
There is no other Savior besides Yahweh Jehovah. Let's go to Isaiah 63, verses 7 to 9. Watch here. Guys, read. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord, Jehovah, and the praises of the Lord, Jehovah, according to all that Jehovah has bestowed on us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. Now pay attention to 8 and 9, folks. 8 and 9. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. I am Jehovah. There is no savior besides me. Guys, pay attention. Jehovah became their savior. But now notice verse 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. The angel of his face, his presence saved them. In his love and his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. Did you catch it? The same Isaiah said that Jehovah saved them. The angel of his face saved them. The angel who beholds his face, who embodies his face, he saved them. And now person number three, Isaiah 63, 14. Isaiah 63, 14. Isaiah 63, 14. And as a beast goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest. The Spirit who belongs to Jehovah gave his people rest during the time of Moses, because that's the context. You lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. So let's count. Jehovah is their Savior. The angel of Jehovah's face, who beholds his face, who embodies his face, saved them. And the Spirit of Jehovah gave them rest. How many is that? How many is that, folks? Count. Jehovah, the angel of his face, and the Spirit. So who gave them rest? The Spirit of Jehovah. But in Exodus 33, 14, I'll do the accent one more time. Exodus 33, 14, you know who gave them rest? Jehovah did. Here it's the Spirit belonging to Jehovah who gave them rest. But in Exodus 33, 14, it says, Jehovah gave them rest. And he said, my presence, there's his presence again, his face, which the angel is, will go with you and I will give you rest. <whistles> hmm. Jehovah gave them rest. The spirit that belongs to Jehovah gave them rest. Jehovah saved them and saves them. The angel who is his face, his presence, who beholds his face, his presence, saved them. How many is that? Three, right? And he was saying, one God, one God. How many God you got? One God, one God. One God. Yeah. How many God? Hey, 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 man. Yeah, well, you ain't going to tell me what you do. How many God got? Yeah, hey, 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 hey. One of them is a hole. All right. You ready? <laughs> Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Okay, let's go there. Yeah, man. Hey, man. Yeah, fuck it. You, you know my lady Naomi, man. Now you homie, fuck her. You homie, homie. Hey, homie. Stop with Naomi. And you homie. Hey, homie. All right. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yep, exactly. Now, everyone with me? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You with me there? Okay. The first question you ask all of them is, one what exactly? Okay, one what? When it says the Lord our God is one, one what? If I say America is one nation, what does that mean? It's only one person? If I say that's one family, what does that mean? There's only one person, right? If I say he's got one car, but wait, what does one car mean? A car can have two doors or four doors. It can have, it's got to have four, four wheels. It's got to have an engine and a transmission. And it's got to have a trunk. You see, one what? So you ask them, number one, when you say God is one, one what exactly? They're assuming, here's the assumption. God is one person and say, prove it. Prove it. Show me where it says God is one person. Yes, God is one. There's no denying it. But what is he exactly when we say he's one? One person, 
one being, one essence. What exactly do you mean? Because saying one doesn't mean anything. I'll give you an example. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Yep, let me show you. Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Did you catch it? One flesh. And the Hebrew is basar achad, achad. And that word one is the same word used for Jehovah in Deuteronomy 6, 4. But here's the problem, folks. Isn't Adam a flesh person with his own flesh body? Yes. Isn't his wife, Chava, Eve, her own flesh person with her own flesh body? Yes. So Adam is flesh with his own flesh body. Eve is flesh with her own flesh body. That's two, but it says when they come together in intimacy, they're one flesh. So obviously one flesh cannot mean they're one person or one flesh person or one physical body because it's two flesh persons, a male and a female, with two distinct flesh bodies coming together in unity. Okay, now let me give you another one. Genesis 5 verse 2. Genesis 5 verse 2. King James captures it perfectly. The King James captures it perfectly. Well, my friend first last is going to get blocked as he went to the new King James. All right. King James version. What happened to Protestant? He checked out. We need King James. All right. Male and female created he them. Male and female created he them. Guys, pay attention. Male and female created he them, blessed them, plural, called their name Adam and the day when they were created. Oh, whoa, you didn't catch it. The Hebrew says Adam. That's why the King James captures it perfectly. One more time. One more time. Genesis 5 verse 2. Okay. Male and female. There goes the male, Adam, female, Eve. He created them, them, not him, blessed them. Called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So wait, both the male and the female are one flesh. Both the male and the female are Adam. So the one Adam is male and female, and they're one flesh, but they're not one person. They're not one physical being. So why would we assume that God, who's infinitely more complex than his creatures, can be one God without being one person? Wow. No, he can't make himself whatever he wants because God is who he is eternally, unchangeably, immutably. God is who he is. Unchangeably, immutably, he is who he is and will be that way forever. When you're talking about the essence of God. You with me there? So, folks, do you see Adam... Is male and female, two physical flesh bodies, two flesh persons that are one flesh. And yet they want us to believe that the one God can only be limited to one person. Why? Why is that? Why does God have to be one person? So God is one. Amen. He's one. One what? One person, one essence, one attribute, one characteristic. Is he? What is he? That doesn't tell me anything. So you saw that, right? And then he went to Jude verse 25. Okay, let's go to Jude 25 in the King James because he was using Jude, the King James version. Jude 25. Okay, let's read. He was quoting Jude 25. Okay. The, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion, power, both now and forever. Say, say, man, what well, well, God? What well, God is why? Yeah. Now you ain't going to help you, son. All right. Let's read Job. Let's read Jude. Let's read verses 24 and 25. 24 and 25. Okay. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise, 
God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Now, did you pay attention unto him that is able, able to keep you from falling, right? This, the only wise God, keeps you from falling, right? From falling away, he preserves you, right? Okay. But now let's read Jude 1, verse 1. 1, verse 1. Now, wait, right here. 1, verse 1. Patriot, I hope you're not joking because I won't block you. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ Jesus and called. So the one God is preserving you in your relationship to Christ, in union with Christ. So their God and Christ are distinct because their God means God the Father. You see it? You see it? So the God who preserves you, preserves you what? Verse 1 says, in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. So God there must be the Father in distinction from Jesus. So again, God and Jesus. And both of them are one in essence, but not the same person. Now Jude 1, 20 to 21. Jude 1, 20 to 21. I don't know. Man, this guy made it late on me. Okay. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So notice, count again. You're praying in unit with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches you how to pray and guides you and moves you to pray. So always seek to pray in union with the Holy Spirit by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's one. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Hmm. That's two. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Oh, three again and only three. Holy Spirit, God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. That sounds like the Trinity. Wow. Wow, man. And who is going to save you and grant you everlasting life? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So the only wise God, our Savior, isn't only the Father. He's the only wise God and Savior in union with the Son and the Holy Spirit, even though they're not the same person. Thank you, AZ. God bless you, Super Chatters. Pray I collect soon. I got to collect these for the glory of Jesus. I have not collected them, but hopefully they're there safe and secure. Clear? No, Latrix, it doesn't. Because it may put an end to Jehovah's Witnesses and Christadelphians who believe Jesus is a man. But appealing to Titus 2.13, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, a modalist, a oneness would say, Amen. Jesus is our great God and Savior, and he's the Father. Because only the Father is the great God and Savior. You see that? Everyone got it? So, folks, if you want to ask me questions related to the Trinity other subjects... I'll go walking a little later. I won't go because I was going to go to the mountains. I can't do that now. It's too late. But I still got to get my walk in by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. This is why I'm hesitant to even engage these men because none of them are qualified. They're all loud mouths. They all manifest. They're demonized. They hate the Trinity. They hate the real Jesus thinking they worship the true God and they waste our time. But I'm trusting the Holy Spirit will still use what they intended for evil for the greater good in glorifying Jesus Christ. No, there is no different schema. Why are you making a big deal out of capitalization? In Hebrew and Greek, that's irrelevant. Yes, Luis, there are many mentions of demons. James 2.19 is one. James 2.19, let's look at it. So you see every passage he cited backfires against him. Every passage he cited backfires against him. I don't respond to Hindus. That's not my specialty. Why would I want to respond to Hindus? There are Christians who respond to Hindus. James 2.19. Thou believes that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The devils also believe and tremble. What's called devils here? Simply another term for demons. Right? A demon is a devil. A devil is a demon. Mobile, if you haven't been wa watching my sessions then I can see why you'd ask me that question. The difference is, is the way they translate it. Okay, hold on. We got another guy. Another stuff here. Call me now. I am live. So you can 
put you in your place. Hold on. Other heretic. Let's see. Hold on. On this guy, I will block you. Block. Oh, they are, man. They, they're tough guys on the comment section, but they don't ever, never will come and defend. Because, see, this is the thing. This is what they like to do. They like to go to the comment section, bombard you with 50,000 posts, 50,000 words per post, not addressing any issue, but avoiding your direct criticisms and think they're going to get away with it. They don't know. I have a special kind of YouTube. The other name for my YouTube channel, besides Shemunian, it's block.com. You come and you rant, I'll block you. So there's two names to my YouTube channel, Shemunian slash block.com. You don't come in the comment section and then bombard the comment section with 50,000 words, 50,000 posts, each post with 50,000 words, attacking, mocking, blaspheming, and never addressing questions but attacking straw man, throwing out red herrings. You come and call live because then I'll put you in your place. That's what they do, don't they? Don't they do that? Tell me I'm lying. Tell me I'm lying. I like how Kima keeps telling me what to do. I like Kima. Kima would keep posting me in the comment section. Do more on oneness. Do more on oneness. Do more on moralism. Moral. Kima, I don't know if you're a sister or a brother because your name Kima. Is it sister or brother before I move on? And I'll answer some other questions. Kima, is that a female or a male? Kima. I don't know. Why would I get an... Oh, I thought you said get a progressive Christian teacher. You scared me for a minute. Oh, you're a male? Kimo, do you want to tell me when to wake up in the morning, what to eat, what shirts I can wear when I go walking, what time to go to sleep, what toothpaste to use? Because I love you, Kimo. You know, I love you. All right. I thought, yeah, yeah. I Hopefully, I'll get some anti-progressive Christian apologists to refute progressive Christianity as a satanic distortion of scripture. Okay, folks, you guys have any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Someone asked me about today I've begotten thee. You're referring to Acts 13, 32, 33. Kima, you're probably not listening, Kima. So you want to tell me what to eat, how to brush my teeth, you know, who to date, which woman I should marry or should become a monk? I love you, Kima. Not too much. All right. Acts 13, 32, 33, Hebrews 1, verse 5. There's too many strong proofs. So you don't just limit it to one. Acts 13, 32, 33, and Hebrews 1, verse 5, because this is what he's referring to. And we declare unto you glad tidings how that, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, the promise which were made unto the fathers, You guys actually let this guy's comment go by Mr. Bubble. Which mod would let Mr. Bubble blaspheme Jesus that way and not block him? Who's the one who did that? The guy's mocking Jesus, blaspheming Jesus, and you then unhide his comment? The guy was mocking, blaspheming Jesus, and you unhide his comment? Okay. Thank you, guys. Now, for the rest of you, for the one who asked me, Alan J., Alan J, Acts 13, 32, 33, there, Psalm 2, 7, where it says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Paul quotes it in reference to what, Alan J, because you asked me the question. Notice, and we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, okay, God hath fulfilled the same unto their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day I've begotten you. I've begotten thee, begotten you. Alan J., do you see Paul quotes Psalm 2-7 where God says, You are my son, today I've begotten you in connection with Jesus being raised to life, resurrected to physical immortality, on his way to being <clears throat> taken into heaven, ascending into heaven to sit on God's right hand in heaven. Thank you, Panos. God bless you. And now let us see how Hebrews cites it. The book of Hebrews. Hebrews 1, verses 3 to 5. Hebrews 1, verses 3 to 5. Hebrews 1, verses 3 to 5. 
I wish I could, Church of the East. Do you know of any? Any that come? Hebrews 1, verse 3, 5. Now, Alan J. Reed, because this is your question I'm answering. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So when he sat down on the right hand of the majesty of high, he became higher than the angels in position and status because while he was on earth, he was in a position of a servant and made himself voluntarily less than the angels in position. But then he ascended to sit and throne with his father in heaven. And so now his status and position became once again greater and superior to the angels. And then the author of Hebrews quotes two passages to show it. Hebrews 1 5. For to which of the angels, for unto which of the angels did God ever say, said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So, Alan J. Alan J., are you listening? Because I'm answering your question. Alan J. Were you there? Are you there? Well, you were there, but are you there now? Because he asked me the question. So when did God beget Jesus? Well, according to Psalm 27, it refers to Jesus being enthroned in heaven on the right side of the Father, sitting on heaven's throne after his physical resurrection, physical ascension into heaven, seated with the Father on the heavenly throne, as the heir of David, as the son of David, as the Messiah who fulfills the promises to David, that David would have a physical son sitting on the throne of David, ruling on that throne in the place of David, in fulfillment of the promises of David forever and ever. Wasim Hermes, God bless you. You want me there? So Alan J., the begetting has nothing to do, Alan J. Is it 500 rounds? God bless you, brother. Wasim, Lord bless you, brother. God bless you. Now I got it collected. You know how many super chats I've been receiving over the past months I haven't collected? Thank you, guys. God bless you. I have to collect. It's sitting there. Hopefully it's stored away safely. And by the grace of Jesus, I have to collect it. I need to collect it. I have it. Secondly, the only drawback from super chat, folks, I want you to remember this. They take 30% of what you give, 30% of what you give. So let's say he gave 500, 30% they take. Whereas in PayPal, they take much less and give you more. So God bless you guys. And I pray in Jesus' name, I'll be disciplined to go and collect the super chat because it's been months I haven't collected. PayPal, or if you want to be a regular contributor to keep the ministry going regularly, you can do it regularly on PayPal or Patreon. But now that said, Alan J. Alan J. Psalm 2-7 is talking about the Davidic heir, the physical son of David, taking the throne to rule as God's representative on earth. So in that son sense, he becomes God's son in that sense. When David and his sons sat on the throne representing God as king in his place on earth, it was then on that day when they began ruling that God called them his sons, because they would be his sons in the sense that they are to reflect God, reflect God's rule, and God would then protect their rule and their throne from their enemies. So Jesus, as the physical son of David, resurrects on the third day physically, bodily, and because he's still human, a glorified human, he's still a son of David, and then he ascends into heaven and sits on the throne with the Father, not just as God's divine son, eternal son, but as the physical son of David, and when he sits on the throne in heaven as David's physical son, he then becomes the son of God in that sense, like David was and Solomon was, and all the kings of Israel were, were on that day. Clear? Alan J? Now, Alan J, go back to my YouTube channel. I did several sessions on Hebrews 1. 
So do a search for my talks on Hebrews 1 because I went in depth on what it means for the Lord Jesus Christ to be the begotten Son of God according to Psalm 2 verse 7 and Hebrews 1 verse 5. I gave in-depth exposition on several sessions. It's there, archived. Watch them, hit the like button, pass these videos on to reach more people for the glory of the Chime God. Thank you, Luis. Yes, uh, Prof 2, unfortunately, YouTube takes 30%. They're, they're crooks, they're thieves. The showbread is the bread of the presence. Exodus 25. The showbread means the bread of the presence. Right? Is that what you're referring to? That there would be 12 pieces of bread right by the curtain behind which you had the most holy, the ho most holy, the holy, and the holy of holies. And behind the curtain you had the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. When you say physical appearance of the Logos, what do you mean physical appearance? Do you mean the Logos, the Word, who is Jesus, became a flesh and blood human being in the Old Testament? Is that what you're asking? Are you asking, did Jesus as the Word, the Logos, appear as a flesh and blood human being in the Old Testament? No. Jesus never appeared as a flesh and blood human being because he never became flesh and blood. Do you mean that he assumed a human form, a human appearance without actually being flesh and blood, becoming physical, becoming a human being by nature, actually taking on actual flesh and blood, but he simply appeared as a man in human form, in human appearance? So when you saw him, he looked human, and when you touched him, it felt like an actual physical body? Yes, that he did quite often. You with me there? Because the reason why I'm saying that is because people think that when God appeared in the Old Testament as a man, that means he actually became an actual flesh and blood human being taking on an actual additional nature. No, that's not what he did. God can assume any form without becoming that thing in nature. For example, God can appear as a flame of fire without becoming fire in nature. Okay. The only time the Logos, the word, what we call in Sarks, in Sarks, in flesh, the only time the Logos actually became flesh is when he entered the blessed womb of his virgin mother who conceived his physical body, human nature, by the Holy Spirit without sexual intercourse and gave birth to him as a virgin. That's the only time he actually took on human nature actually took on flesh and actually took on a second nature and actually became the very thing that nature that he took to himself it <clears throat> happens to be. You with me there? Yeah, you know, for that, you, you, wait, 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 let me see. The bread of heaven is mushrooms. Can you, Benny, can you say that again? Because I don't want to do to you in a minute. The bread of heaven is mushrooms. The show bread is mushrooms. I didn't want to hear this. The show bread, the bread of the presence, the bread of his face is mushrooms. You, you're kidding me, right? I'm sitting there like stumped. What? All right. Johnny, is that Johnny Torch's question? Hold on. Yeah. Folks, a lot of your questions, I'll answer again, but a lot of your questions, I want you to remember something. A lot of your questions, I've already answered. If you go to my archive on my YouTube channel, I have done talks for the last two years, and a lot of these questions I've answered in depth, in detail, like the Nephilim, the Nephilim, the Nephilim. But let me answer it again. Okay. Let me answer it again. Okay. Who are the Nephilim, Nephilim in Genesis 6 verse 4? Let's look at it. Let's go to Genesis 6 verse 4. Yes, it's only an appearance or I'll end. Because if you consider that the other two were angels, angels are not human beings by nature. They are not of the dust of the earth. 
They don't have physical bodies of the dust of the earth. So angels can assume human form and do human things in those human forms without actually becoming flesh and blood by nature, taking on additional nature. Those are appearances that they can manifest. Okay. Genesis 6 verse 4. No, Michael Stark. No, be careful, brother. Don't answer a question asked of me. Let me answer it, brother. Genesis 6 verse 4. There were giants in the earth. And that word giant is the word Nephilim or Nephilim. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which are of old men of renown. Let's let's reread it again. Let's reread it carefully. Again, let's see if you catch it. Let's reread it again. Let's reread it carefully. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. Notice, also after that. After when? After those days. So when were the giants on earth? There were giants in those days and even afterwards. After when? After the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and bare children to them. If you actually read it carefully, if you actually read it carefully and you read it, the Nephilim, the giants, are not the offspring of the sons of God, which they started from the daughters of men. But these giants were there when this was taking place. Reread it again, Genesis 6 verse 4. Reread it again. Guys, don't mind me get something to drink because I wasn't expecting to do this. Let me get something to drink. Post it again. Reread. Genesis 6 verse 4. Hey, hold on. Let me get this. Woo! Man, I'm going to have to go walk. I'm not going to walk them out, but sorry. Okay, now watch. Okay. Let's see who caught it if you reread it. Yep. And this is impromptu. I didn't even advertise it. Glory to Jesus Christ. Our numbers are increasing of quality people. I want quality people. I want a lot of them for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. We're getting like 300 and plus. And I didn't even announce this. Now, one more time, Genesis 6, verse 4. Genesis 6, verse 4. One more time. Okay. Read it again, Michael Stark, everyone else. This is where you need the Holy Spirit to help you and illuminate you to see clearly, perfect our sight spiritually and physically. Read. Watch here. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So it's telling you giants were there at a certain period when a certain phenomenon was occurring. A certain event was taking place. So when were they there? When the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. Do you catch it? So the plain reading, the plain reading, the Nephilim, the giants are not the offspring of the sons of God. But the Nephilim, the giants, were there when the sons of God sired children from the daughters of men. But did you notice it said they were also there after that? Do you know when? When Moses says after that, meaning after this event. How long after that event do we find the giants again? Because it says they were there when the Son of God got women pregnant with their offspring. And afterwards, afterwards, let's go to Numbers 13, 31 to 33. Numbers 13, 31 to 33. Yep, he did, 1611, on your way to heaven. Man, I hope you're still watching my YouTube session, 1611, because I don't see you participate as often. Guys, read. This is now at the time of Moses. During the wilderness, they've, they've just left Egypt. They're in the wilderness during the time of Exodus. At the time of Moses, notice what they say. Twelve spies from the twelve tribes scout the land of Canaan, and it takes them 40 days. When there in Canaan, they saw who? Pay attention. 33. Numbers 13, 31, 33. But the men went up with, the, with him, said, we... Be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. 
And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had ser searched unto the children of Israel, saying, notice what they say, saying, okay, watch here. The land through which we have gone to search, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Why? And there we saw the giants. Guess what the Hebrew word is? Nephilim, Nephilim. And who are the giants? The son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Now, can you do me a favor? Can you check for this last? Numbers 13.33 in the New King James, does it say Nephilim? Roman, are you a brother saying I'm handsome? I'm still waiting for sisters who are beautiful, love Jesus, telling me I'm handsome. It's only the guys that are telling me I'm handsome. Lisa, don't insult the Nephilim. They're not as ugly and filthy as Muhammad Hijab. Okay, so it doesn't say Nephilim here, huh? Okay. Can you see? I think there are translations that say Nephilim. Can you look and see? I'm sorry. There's so many translations out there, I don't. I can't keep up. Yep, there it goes. This is what? The Christian Standard Bible, guys. Christian Standard Bible. Even... We even saw the Nephilim there, Christian Standard Bible. We even saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. To ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers, and we must have seemed the same to them. Yep. No, I, Bashan, I don't believe, was 18 feet tall. I think he was close to 9 feet tall. The coffin containing his body was 18 feet, but doesn't mean he was 18 feet. Okay. ESV as well. All right, everyone got it? Okay, so what's the answer? The Nephilim are not the offspring of the sons of God with daughters of men. They're not the same. If you let the text speak, they're a group of human beings that are excessively large and in the case of these examples, also evil, who stood in opposition to God, and God wiped them out. You get my point? Even if you look at Goliath, Goliath was a Nephilim, right? He's a Nephilim. He was a giant, right? But he wasn't 18 feet. He was about 9 feet, a little over 9 feet, 6 fingers, 6 toes. So from that perspective, to be 8 feet, 9 feet, you're a giant. But we imagine it as mythical proportions. Oh, giant, 18 feet. No, that's not it. No, no. And whether you like it or not, in, our, in the human gene pool, in the genetic stream of the human gene pool, in the human gene pool, we have the potential to sire giants and dwarfs. You see dwarfs and you see giants. That's all part of the human gene pool. Tenshi. Don't insult the Nephilim. Muhammad Ajab is hideous and ugly, and he's a coward who won't debate me. The Nephilim were prettier than him. Okay? Did that answer the question? Okay, if that answered the question, I was asked about the Christian interpretation of the Shema. The Christian interpretation of the Shema? Someone asked me that question. Can you repeat that question again? Who asked me that question? Someone asked me about it. I think he left. Let's see. Hopefully, ask me. Uh, yeah, Isaiah 48 16. You can use that to show there are two divine persons, but not conclusively there are three. Anyway, the Orthodox Moor had asked me. What's the Christian interpretation of Deuteronomy 6.4? The Trinitarian interpretation, because the only true Christian is a Trinitarian. Any other Christian who denies the Trinity is not a Christian. He's a fake. He is a tool of the devil who is deceived and a deceiver until he or she repents and accepts the true God. Thank you, Sarah. But Sarah, come on now. I don't need Mary's sisters to tell me I'm handsome. I want... A beautiful model Christian woman who's single, loves Jesus, say, Sam, you're handsome, so I can hook up. No, I'm just kidding. Put that aside. Okay. What's the Christian interpretation of Deuteronomy 
It's referring to the essential unity of the Godhead. It's referring to the essential unity of the Godhead. Yes, Michael Stark. Michael Stark, do you remember that baseball player named Sammy Sosa? He used to play for the Cubs. God bless you guys for the super chat. Do you remember Sammy Sosa used to play for the Cubs? Polydactylism. You guys remember that? You guys remember Sammy Sosa? You guys don't remember he used to play for the Cubs? Okay. Well, Michael Stark, I want you to Google yeah, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa. Did you know he had six fingers? Did you know he had six fingers? He was a professional baseball player who played for the Chicago Cubs. He had six fingers, still has, he's still alive. My first cousin on my mother's side, my first cousin, I've seen him with my own eyes. He's got six fingers. Yep, Ms. V, exactly. So why would it shock you that Goliath would have six fingers and six toes? That's part of the human gene pool. The fall has affected and tainted and corrupted the human gene pool. Johnny Torch, I don't believe that. I believe they are angelic creatures who defied God and sin against the Lord and cohabited with women, which was an abomination. Anyway, Deuteronomy 6.4, let me answer that question again. Deuteronomy 6.4, let's post it and let me answer that question. Sorry. Got to get glasses. Tired. Pray for your teacher. 48 years old and I feel older than my age. And pray for my health and my sight. I may need to get glasses. Pray the Lord will give me the health for as long as he wants me to serve him. Pray God will save me and my daughters from COVID and save you as well. Don't have health insurance. So I trust Jesus, my Lord, the great physician, to be my health insurance. Ms. V, but you still look young, and I'm sure you're healthier than me. Okay. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, how does a Trinitarian, Trinitarian interpret Deuteronomy 6, 4? How does a Trinitarian interpret Deuteronomy 6, 4? Deuteronomy 6.4 refers to the essential unity of the Godhead. When it says the Lord our God is one, we take it to mean that the God we worship is one in his essence, but the persons of God are three, right? Why do I say that? Why do I say that's how we interpret it? Because obviously the Father is God, his eternal Son, his eternal Word, and his eternal Spirit are one with him in essence and inseparable from him, and therefore, because the essence of the Father is the essence of the Son and the Spirit, their essence being one, they're not one person but one God. Now, I, I trust the Lord, Daisy. Don't worry. I, I know the Lord's in the church. Now, do you want me to show you how the New Testament interprets Deuteronomy 6, verse 4? Do you want me to unpack the way the New Testament interprets Deuteronomy 6, 4? Who's interested in that? Okay. We're going to have to look at Mark 12, 29, when Deuteronomy 6, 4 is quoted. The Lord Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4 in Mark 12, 29. Okay, now watch. I'm going to have to go into the Greek a little bit. You don't need to be Greek scholars. You don't need to be Greek scholars. Because right here, thank God for modern technology. The Lord has blessed us with these free resources to use to perfect ourselves for the glory of Jesus. Mark 12, 29, when our Lord is asked, what is the greatest commandment? Notice what he says. And Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. Click on that link. This is what you're going to see. Akue Israel. Now, forgive me for butchering the Greek because the way New Testament scholars pronounce the Greek is called the Erasmian pronunciation. Now, there are some who are learning to pronounce it the way native Greek speakers do, right? But if you heard Edward Dalcor earlier in the session, he was using the Erasmian pronunciation, right? 
a native Greek person doesn't pronounce it that way. Like, for example, you hear someone who's taught to pronounce the New Testament Greek a la Erasmian style, the Erasmian way, will say, a kuriasmu kai ha theasmu. A Greek person will say, what? So how does the native Greek speaker say it? O kiriusmu. O kiriusmu. But someone taught to pronounce the Greek in the New Testament. Erasmian style, a la Erasmian way. O kuriasmu kai ha theasmu. And the Greek speaker is saying, man, what language is that? Man, that's your language, Greek, stupid. Speaking Greek. No, you ain't. You're speaking something, but it ain't Greek. So a native Greek speaker would say, O kiriusmu, O kiriusmu, O teosmu, O teosmu. Right? Okay, now, if you go to Mar if you go to the link here, click on it. Don't take my word for it. Click on it. You're going to see, in the Greek it says, Akue Israel, Kerios or Kurios, O Theos, O Theos, Hemon, Kurios, Ha Theos, Hemon, Kerios or Kurios, Is Esteem, Kurios, Heis Esteem. Okay, guys, Arsenal, don't worry about my denomination now. Just pay attention so you can learn. Okay, guys, if you click on the link, you're going to see, Kurios Heis Estin. That's the Erasmian way. Steve, who speaks Greek, liked it when I pronounced it the Greek way. Kyrios is Estin. Kyrios is Estin. But I'm not going to speak it the way Greek speakers do. Okay, this is what you're going to see. Can you click on that link and see that's what you see? Kyrios Heis Estin. Can you confirm? That's what you see before I move on. And I'm using BibleHub.com. BibleHub.com for those of you who come later. Okay. Okay, why is it important? Here you go. The word kurios is Lord. Heis is the Greek word. Is is the word for one. Estin, the movable new. He is. Okay, let me do it again. Kurios, kurios, that's the word Lord. Is or heis, that's a word one. Esteen, st, esteen is he is. So it's kurios is esteen or kurios heis esteen. Lord, one he is. Lord, one he is. Everyone with me there? Lord, one he is. Everyone with me there? Okay, so pay attention. This is the Greek version of Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In Greek, this is how you say it in Greek. Akue Israel. Right? Kurios, hotheos hemon. Kurios, heis estin. That's your Aspian pronunciation. Okay? Pay attention, guys. Don't get involved in side discussion. Lose your focus. Okay? Now, the Hebrew goes like this. The Hebrew goes like this. Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael. Yahovah yod he vav he Eloheinu. Yahovah yod he vav he echad. Yahovah Eloheinu. Yahovah echad. Okay. So, the word Eloheinu in Mark 12, 29 was translated as ho theos hemon. Okay, everyone there? See, I'm teaching you and making it so simple it's for you to get it. So, thank you, confidence in Christ ministries. Lord bless you. Okay, so again, the Hebrew word, our God, Eloheinu, Eloheinu. The Greek is ho theos hemon, or ho theos hemon, okay? Him on. You guys see that? Eloheinu in Greek. Ha theos hemon. Our God is the God of us in Greek. Eloheinu ha theos hemon. Okay, so what is Yahweh Echad in Greek? Yahweh Echad in Greek is 
Perius, ice is esteem. So, Yahweh, Yahovah, Echad. In Greek, pay attention. In Greek would be Kyrios, Kurios, is heis, esteem. Everyone got that so far? You're again getting meat. By the grace of the trine God, we were giving you meat again. Everyone got it? So how does a Greek speaker who is Jewish, a Jewish Greek speaker who wants to say Yahovah Echad, Jehovah's one, in Greek, who doesn't like to use the divine name? Because early on among the Jews, there was a reticence, a hesitation to use the word Yahovah. So what did they use instead? Adonai. So when Jews would speak of God outside the temple in worship, they would say Adonai. That's the word Lord, not Yahovah. So a Greek-speaking Jew, a Jew who speaks Greek, doesn't say Adonai, which is Hebrew Lord. He would say Kerius, Kurias. You get it? So if you're a Greek-speaking Jew and you wanted to say Adonai Echad, which is the way a Jew would say Yahovah Echad, you would say Kirius Is, Is Kirius, Heis Kurias, Kurias Heis. Because anti-Unitarian Christian, the Jews viewed the divine name as being so sacred and holy out of their fear of using it in vain, they chose not to use it in conversation. It'd be used in connection with the worship in the temple and specifically by the priests, right? So what would they say in everyday speech among themselves? If you're speaking Hebrew, you would say Adonai. If you say if Aramaic, Mar. Mar. Greek, Kyrios, Kurias. Everyone with me there? You understand? Before I move on to the next point. That's why if you find Orthodox Jews today, you know what Orthodox Jews today say? They don't say Adonai. They say Hashem, the name. Hashem. They don't even say Adonai. The Orthodox will say Hashem. Right? And even if they want to say the word Elohim, they don't pronounce it correctly. They'll say Elohim, Elohim, Kim. They mispronounce it deliberately. Okay, so a Greek-speaking Jew, if you said to a Greek-speaking Jew, pay attention, pay attention now. If you if you said to a Greek-speaking Jew, Jew, Kyrios is, or if you said Kurios highs, or if you said to him, is Kyrios. Hi, Skurias. What you just said to his ears, Jehovah's one, one Jehovah. Jehovah's one, one Jehovah. Did that sink in? Did that sink in? Because you're going to see why I took all this time. Why, Sam, did you waste our time with this information? It wasn't a waste. It's education. I'm educating you. I'm educating you. Okay? You know why? Because now you're going to see the Shema, here is the Lord our God, the Lord is one, mentioned by Paul and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, interpreting it to refer to two divine persons. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Now get ready. And I've actually discussed this in previous sessions. But glory to God, where creatures repetition, we need to hear something over and over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of the Lord. Okay, now watch here. Um, before we quote it, let me get you the Greek. Let me get you the Greek so you can be blown away. There's so many nuggets in scriptures that the Holy Spirit has given. And you know what the duty of a Christian is? There are nuggets and gems and diamonds and gold that the Holy Spirit wants us to dig and discover and unpack. Right? And you know how the Holy Spirit unpacks it? Either by you reading it and he shows you directly or by having others that he has shown to share it with you. 
That's why the Holy Spirit raises up teachers like Eddie Dalcor and Anthony Rogers to then show you what the Spirit is revealing to the people of God, irrefutable proof that the God of the Bible is Father, His Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, now, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, one more time. Let's see if you're going to catch it. Guys, I'm going to show you what the Greek is in a minute. But to us, there's one God. O Theos, Apater. But there's one God. Of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. One Lord Jesus Christ is Isus Kyrius. Ah, oh, but wait, he says, is Kyrius Isus Christos. Sorry, I, I was, all right, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Did you catch it? Catch it? Paul said, because it's in Greek, there's the link. I just gave you the link. He just said in Greek. Look what he said in Greek. Paul said in Greek, Is Kyrios Jesus Christos. Heis Kurios Jesus Christos. Did you catch it? So who is the O Theos? O Theos, the Father. Who is the Is Kyrios Jesus Christos? But wait, Paul, you're a monotheistic Jew. Of course I am. You know, to a Greek-speaking Jew, when you say is kirius, heis kurios, that is the Greek way of saying one Jehovah. Yes. But wait, you said is kirius, Jesus Christos. In other words, you just said one Jehovah, Jesus Christ. I understand that anti unitarian didn't mean anything by it, but timing is of the essence. The worst time to chime in and say, sounds like Greek yoke, is when I'm unpacking it to show the glory of the triune God. When I'm unpacking it to show the glory of the triune God and the glory and the dignity of Jesus. And then you make that comment to make someone else laugh, robbing this moment of the reverence that it deserves. You're a genius, anti-Unitarian Christian. I have to admit, you are a genius. You are such a genius that you thought that making fun of Greek at this time when we're trying to revere the Lord, oh, that was really, yeah. And you're still doing LOL? Sorry, LOL. Do you see me laughing, buddy? And he still does LOL. Really? That was my brother. Yeah, that's what I'm throwing the Did any of you besides that other DJ, that other clown that laughed, do you think it was funny? That I'm talking about the inspired language of the New Testament, where Jesus is called, Jesus is called the one Jehovah, and this guy sounds says it sounds like a Greek yogurt commercial. Any of you thought it was funny? Crisco, it's not mono, it's Is heis. I still don't like your nasty attitude, anti Unitarian Christian, because even your note isn't sincere and you said LOL. Convince me not to block you. Convince me not to block you. I still don't like your nasty attitude. Look, I, nope, I apologize. No, you didn't, because you said sorry, LOL. I dare you be a man and go to a mosque and make fun of the Arabic of the Quran. If you come out alive, I'll be surprised. But you're you're not a man among Muslims to mock their Quran. You're a man at, when it comes mocking the scriptures of our God. That's the respect you show Jesus. This is the stuff I was talking about in the previous session. The sissified, effeminate Christians who have no fear and reverence for God. I want to know why I should keep you after this. Sounds like a Greek commercial. In fact, get the hell out of my YouTube channel. Get him out of here. Block him. I want you out of here. Mocking the Lord. We're quoting Greek to identify Jesus as Jehovah. Sounds like a Greek yogurt commercial. 
Anyone else thought it was funny? Let me start cleaning house. I don't want people who have no fear of the Lord and respect for his scriptures here. I want large number of quality people who revere the Lord. Anyone else thought it was funny? Please let me know so you can leave. Anybody else? Okay, for the rest of you, and that other clown that laughed, LOL, you thought it was funny, clown? Okay, that laughed at his joke? Okay, now, for the rest of you, for the rest of you, you understand what the point of the Greek was? Here it is, guys, click on the link, click on the link, click on it, go read the Greek for yourself, Notice the Greek says, Is Kyrios, or Heis Kurios, Jesus Christos. Jesus Christos. So it says, O Theos. It says, Is O Theos. Is O Theos. Heis Ha Theos. The Father. And then it says, Is Kyrios, Heis Kurios, Jesus Christos. Did you guys catch it for those of you paying attention? Paul is writing in Greek. Paul is writing in Greek. And to a Greek speaking Jew, when you say, O Theos, that's Jehovah. When you say, Is O Theos, that's Jehovah. Right? But when you also say to a Greek speaking Jew, Jew is Kyrios, is Kyrios, or Kyrios is one Lord. That's the Greek way of saying Jehovah's one, one Jehovah. But you see what he did? Shockingly, you see what he did? No, Alan, that's not it. The word Kyrios is not always the name Jehovah in Greek. That's not what I said. You guys got to go back. Don't misrepresent me. Don't misquote me because you're going to embarrass yourselves. I did not say Kyrios in of itself means Jehovah or God. I said that when the Jews want to say Yahovah Echad, Jehovah's one, because they didn't like to use the word Jehovah out of reverence for the name, they would replace it with either Adonai in Hebrew, Mar in Aramaic, or Kyrios Kurios in Greek. But I did not say that Kyrios or Kurios necessarily means God, necessarily means Jehovah. Because the word Kurios, Kyrios, is also used to refer to someone who's your master, your Lord, your owner. No, he didn't conflate is Theos. Renatos, let me explain it now. Everyone got it? Let me now back up and explain. Because I took much longer than necessary. But I'm trying to benefit you guys. Okay. Do you understand? First, did you understand when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. When he said, Heis kurios, or is kurios, if you want to say like the Greeks do. Jesus Christos. To a Greek-speaking Jew. To a Jew who speaks Greek. When he hears, is kurios, he's thinking... Jehovah's one, one Jehovah, okay? So when then you fill it out and you say, Is Kyrios, Jesus Christos, that's when you get his attention. <whistles> wait, 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 wait. Wait. Excuse me, Paul, time out. Paul, time out. I heard you say, Is Kyrios, Heis Kurios. Yes. Well, that's Jehovah, Israel's God, who's one, yes. But did I mishear you? Then you went to say, Isus Christos. So, Is Kyrios, one Jehovah, is Jesus Christ? Yep, that one Jehovah became the man, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ is the incarnation, the enfleshment of the one Jehovah. But hold on, Paul. In the first line, you said, Is Theos o Pater, one God, the Father. 
Well, isn't the one God Jehovah too? Yes. But here you said the one God is the Father. But here you said the one Lord, Jehovah who's one, is Jesus Christ. Yes. So what are you telling me? The one Lord God of Israel is Father and Son? Yes. You understand what Paul did with the Shema? This is what he did. Paul said, and he didn't do it, by the way. He inherited it. Let me break it down what he did. You know, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, where it says, Shema Israel, Shema Israel, yod Hey vav -Hey. Shema Israel, Yahovah, Eloheinu. Eloheinu is Hebrew, our God. You know what Paul did? He didn't do it when I say Paul because he wrote it. Pay attention now. When Paul, what Paul is showing here is the word Eloheinu, our God, is the Father. And then he's saying, Yahweh Echad, right? Jehovah One is Jesus Christ. See what he did? So he's saying the Eloheinu is the Father. Yahovah Echad, yod hei vav Echad is Jesus Christ. The Father and the Son make up the identity of the Lord God of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. You see what he did? Before I move on? Exactly, Keisha. That's what exactly he's doing. Who's confused? Because I'm going to wrap it up with this. I may take one more question. If not, because it's already been 76 minutes. Anyone confused? Okay, if you're not confused, let me now further reinforce the fact, further reinforce the fact, okay, that Paul has now identified the Father and the Son as the Lord God of Israel of Deuteronomy 6.4. Let me further prove it. Let's read 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Yes, in fact, if you read the Kabbalah, the Zohar, Renatos, guys, here's an interesting side fact. Did you know the Jewish book of mysticism called Zohar? You know, Kabbalah, Zohar. Did you know that there's a commentary, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and they say that the three names is because God is envisioned as being three-headed, the Lord, our God, the Lord, and they even say, why three? Because it envisions God as being three-headed, three in one. Do you know that? That's the Zohar, the Jewish book of mysticism. Yeah, they go, that's why it's three. Lord, our God, Lord. Do a search, check Google, and you'll find it. Yep. Yep. Okay, now. Zohar, Z-O-H-A-R, Shema, S-H-E-M-A. I just said it, Luffy. Okay, now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Pay attention with me, guys, please, because I got to flesh it out and we're going to be done. I got to flesh it out and we'll be done. But to us, there's but one God, the Father, of whom are all things. Now, first question. When it says there, there's to us one God, the Father, from whom are all things. From whom are all things. Guys, pay attention to what Paul wrote. All things there refers to all creation, right? From God, the Father, all things came into existence. It was the will of God, the Father, to bring all creation into being. From whom are all things. All things came into existence. From God the Father. He decreed, he will, all things come into being. Meaning all creation, right? So what it says, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. For us, there's one God the Father, from whom are all things. All things, all creation came into being from him. He brought them all into being. All things means all creation. Okay, here's my question. Doesn't this prove that God the Father existed before all things? If all things came into existence from him. He must have been there before all creation came into being. Otherwise, he could not will for all things to come into being. That means he exists before all things. 
That means he is separate from all creation. That means he existed before all creation. Therefore, he's uncreated, eternal, right? Right? But now let's read the second half. The second half. Verse 6. The second half. First Corinthians 8, verse 6. But to us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. <whistles> End of story, modalists. End of story, Jehovah's Witnesses. End of story, you humanitarian, Unitarian, heretics, sons of the devil. Because now it says, all things came into being by the one Lord Jesus Christ. So if the Father must have been there before all things, and therefore separate from all things, and if all things means all creation, proving the Father is distinct from all creation and therefore uncreated, the same logic applies to Jesus. Because it says, all things came from the Father by Jesus. All things came from the Father through Jesus. That means that Jesus, that Jesus too must have been there before all things came into existence, must be separate from all things, older than all things. But if all things means all creation, that means he existed before all creation, was there before all things came into being, were created, and therefore, like the Father, he is uncreated and eternal by nature. So there you have Jesus, the Son, and the Father together existing in eternity before all creation. And you can't get around it. Thank you, brother, for the super chat. Lord bless you, brother. But folks, for Jesus to be there... Before all creation came into being, and for Jesus to be the one that the Father used to bring all creation into being, he must be the one God, Jehovah. You know why? Let's go to Isaiah 44, verse 24. Isaiah 44, verse 24. Confidence in Christ's ministries. Brother, uh, brother, which part wasn't clear? I already explained it, man. Can you go back and re-listen? The New Testament never uses the word Jehovah. Did you not hear that I said at the time of Christ, the Jews started using the word Adonai in Hebrew or Mar in Aramaic or Kurias in Greek out of reverence for the divine name? And in the New Testament, when they mention Jehovah, they don't use the word Jehovah, but Kurias, Kurius, Kyrius instead. Okay. Isaiah 44 verse 24. And I'm not trying to... Be frustrated with you, but this is why. Why do you think I hammer, guys? I hammer. Listen, listen, listen. Rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus. Ask the Lord to help you to focus. Don't be distracted. Focus, focus, focus. Go rewatch, re rewatch, re 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 rewatch until it becomes second nature and sick, sinks in by the power of the Spirit so you understand and then you can teach others or you're wasting your time and mine. Okay. Isaiah 44, verse 24. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. Now notice how many creators there are. I am Jehovah that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So Jehovah says, I made all things. I stretch the heavens alone and spread the earth by myself. So did anyone help Jehovah to make all things? Was there anyone there with Jehovah to stretch the heavens and spread out the earth? Do you see it? It says alone by myself, alone by myself. Okay, now let's see how the Jehovah Witness translation reads. Isaiah 44, 24 in the Jehovah Witness translation. This is what Jehovah says, your repurchaser, who formed you since you were in the womb. I am Jehovah who made everything. I stretch out the heavens by myself, and I spread out the earth. Who was with me? Nobody. Now let's see how the Jehovah Witness Bible translates 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6.
1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, and we'll be done, folks. There, there is actually to us one God the Father, from whom are all things, from whom all things are. Job Witness Bible. From whom all things are, and we for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things are, and we through him. The we through him means Jesus is the one who's sustaining you and preserving you and giving you life. We exist through Jesus, meaning in union with Jesus who sustains us, right? And empowers us to honor the Father. Okay, folks, how can Jesus be the one through whom the Father made all things? How can all things have come into being, into <clears throat> existence, through Jesus, by the Father, when Isaiah 44, 24 said, Jehovah made everything, all things. He stretched out the heavens alone, and he spread out the earth by himself. How then can the Father have brought all things into being, all creation into existence, through the Son, if Jehovah said he did it by himself all alone? Because Jesus is one with the Father, and he's Jehovah in the flesh. Do you see why now he's called Is Kyrios Heis Kurios, which is the Greek way of saying Jehovah's one? Right? Now let me blow your minds away by reiterating this point. By, by the way, Lewis, are you related to Carmen Marquez? Is that her last name? Okay, anyway, forget about it. Because uh, yeah, I wonder if there's a relationship between you. Or Tom Marquez. Is it? Yeah, right? All right. Anyway, remember, let me show. Okay, let me share this with you guys. This point you got to get. If you don't get it, you're going to miss the knockout. Okay. Paul is writing to Gentiles, Greeks, who are not ethnically Jews at Corinth. And he's writing in 55 AD. 55 AD. Even Bart Ehrman says it's written 55 AD. Notice he's saying to the, to the Gentiles, the Greeks, to us, meaning this is something we all know and all believe. You Gentiles and me, we all believe this. There's one God, the Father, from whom all things and we for him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and we through him. He's stating this as common knowledge, common possession of faith. Meaning he's stating this as something that the Corinthians already believe and affirm long before he wrote this. In other words, notice he doesn't have to defend this, explain this, and convince him to believe. He's saying, you already know this. For us, we already believe this. This is common knowledge to all of us. We believers in Christ, this is what we share in common. This is what we all believe, what we all agree and are convinced of. Can I ask you a question? What would lead Gentiles, who are not ethnic Jews, Long before 55 AD, because he, when he's writing this, they already believe this. Notice he doesn't have to convince them, hey, you better believe this. And here's why you should, hey, you already know this. You Christians at Corinth, we already know this. We already believe this. We already affirm this. We all agree on this. That means they must have believed this before 55 AD. So guys, let me ask you a question. What would lead a group of Greeks, Gentiles, Greeks, Gentiles, to abandon the worship of the gods and god goddesses of Olympus, to abandon Zeus, Hermes, Diana, Artemis, all of them, Poseidon, and then start worshiping a Jew who less than 20 years earlier was beaten, whipped, nailed to the cross, died and buried, killed by the Romans, Start worshiping him as the one Lord Jehovah with the Father, the creator of all things. And what would lead Paul, a Jew, a monotheistic Jew, and other Jews like Peter, James, and John to start worshiping this flesh and blood Jew, many of whom walked with and saw and touched who had just been beaten and killed and buried, and start worshiping him, this Jew Jesus, as their Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Is 
Exactly, John Doe. You know what convinced them? Number one, Jesus rose again physically, bodily, on the third day, destroying physical death, becoming immortal and glorified. And number two, the Holy Spirit then convincing them that this man was no mere man, and the resurrection proves that he is who he claimed to be, God in the flesh, one with the Father, the eternal companion of the Spirit. Right? But if there's no resurrection, who would believe it? And exactly, John Doe, how can the Father create all creation through Jesus if Jesus is a creature? Does that mean Jesus created himself? Is that clear to everyone? So again, because of an anti-Trinitarian tool of the devil, may God grant them repentance to the true God. This anti-Trinitarian gave me another opportunity to come and spend another hour and a half answering questions to be used of the Holy Spirit, to strengthen us in our faith, to bless us and blow our minds away and destroy any doubt we have and to cause us to fall, fall more in love with the God of the Bible and to see with greater clarity and conviction that the God of the Bible is triune, the Father, His eternal Son, Jesus, who became flesh and the eternal Spirit. He is the true God, the Father, His Son, and the Spirit. There is no other God, and the Bible is Trinitarian. May God cause us to have no doubt that He's the God of the Bible, the God who exists, and to love Him perfectly, to obey Him perfectly, live for Him more passionately, worship Him more consistently, and may he give me the health and all of us the health to continue to serve him and proclaim his glory. May he bless our loved ones, my daughters, and seal them by the Spirit and wash them in the blood of Jesus. Wash your loved ones and seal your loved ones for his glory forever and provide for the ministry and save us from Satan, his children, this corrupt legal system, and from our own sinful passions. We need you, Father. We love you. Lord Jesus, we need you. We love you. Holy Spirit, we need you. We love you. Bless the sound of my voice to the ears of your servants. Perfect my ability to recall the scriptures and give us the power to live the scriptures and to worship you more perfectly. Amen. Maran Athe, Lord Jesus, come sooner than later. We love you, Son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, I'll try to see you guys tomorrow. If the Lord wills, I'll do something tomorrow. Hope you're blessed. Instead of walking, I'm going to go take a nap. I am exhausted. I've been doing nothing but live streams left and right because every heretic that accepts the challenge I come, do a live stream, and they don't last more than 10 minutes. So I need a break. Tomorrow, God willing, I'll exercise. Pray that I can get healthier, lose more weight, and pray my daughters will come to my arms. I haven't seen them in a year. Pray for a miracle. Their mother breaks and grovels before the feet of Jesus and repents so I can have them in my arms. Please, Lord, bring them. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you guys.